Welcome to our second GSMA visual guide using the Quetel BC66 narrowband IoT communications module. In our first guide, I introduced the module and showed you how to install the hardware and software. In this guide, I'm going to show you how to use the communication capabilities for sending data between the module and a server, and we'll also show the operation of power saving mode. So, if you haven't seen the first video yet, I'd recommend to do that first, as we'll be building on that with this guide. To recap briefly, Narrowband IoT is one of two low-power, wide-area technologies that were built specifically for IoT solutions. Both build on existing mobile networks with features that deliver much better power efficiency suitable for long-life battery-powered devices. There's also improved coverage that benefits applications such as in-building IoT devices and wide-area coverage. As in the first video, I'm going to use a Quetel module and the Vodafone network for this guide. But a lot of what I'll be showing you today is actually representative for other setups as well, using different modules and different network operators. So first, I'm going to connect up the Quetel BC66 module to my laptop. Here's the antenna already connected. It also has a Vodafone SIM card which has been plugged in. And to connect it up, I'm just simply putting the micro USB cable into the right socket, and then that's connected to the laptop. I'll be using the Quetel QCOM utility, which allows me to interact with the BC66 module using AT commands. This is a nice, low-level interface that will effectively work with any software stack. I've already prepared a set of AT commands that will establish a narrowband IoT connection to the Vodafone network in the UK and perform some basic socket communications. For this demonstration, I've written a couple of simple Python scripts that will run on my server and will simply echo whatever information they're sent back to the IoT device. This is also a good point to introduce the topic of IoT security. This is an important subject the GSMA has been working on for some years. Vodafone have implemented a number of security measures for IoT devices, including a system of server IP whitelisting. The devices I'm using, or rather their associated network subscriptions, are specifically whitelisted to my server address to add protection against attacks from other machines connected to the internet. We'll be covering the topic of IoT security more widely in a third visual guide, and would recommend viewing this as well as visiting the security area of our website at gsma.com slash IoT security. I'm now rebooting the module so that it's ready to listen for AT commands. You'll see I've set this up with four main blocks of commands. In the first section, I'm configuring the module, including defining which frequency band 20 is being used by Vodafone in the UK. In the second block, I'll be checking for connectivity. And then the third block uses TCP communications. And the fourth block, UDP communications. If you do want to know a little bit more about the configuration steps, it's worth going back to our first visual guide at some point, as I'll be skipping through these steps quite quickly. I'm enabling echoing of commands to the output, getting information about the device, including manufacturer, model, and firmware version, setting the device so that it doesn't go into power save mode, and disabling the device sleep mode. Next, I'm enabling logging of the network registration status and the signaling connection state and display events specific to narrowband IoT. I'm now configuring the device so that it will search for a signal only in band 20. And lastly, configuring the access point name for Vodafone's narrowband IoT service. Now I'll have to wait a little while for the connection to become established. This can take a few minutes the very first time a device connects, but will be much quicker on subsequent occasions. I'm just checking if a data session has been established. Not yet. The device should then indicate when it's attached. OK, that looks like there's a data connection. And that's confirmed by the cgat command. And I can confirm the IP address allocated to the device with the CGP ADDR command. I can also submit a DNS lookup request to the GSMA website. This could take a few seconds. 
There's the response to the DNS lookup. I'm happy that the device is now connected. Now I'm going to run my TCP echo program on the server. You'll be able to see the server side of the communications from the Quectel module. Using the QI open command, I'm opening a socket connection to my server. In the command, you can see the protocol type, followed by the IP address, and then the port number. It's also possible to specify a server by name. You can see that the signaling connection was reopened at the IoT device, and the server shows an open connection. The server shows the IP address of the client connection. As this is different to the IP address at the IoT device, it shows that the device is behind a router in the Vodafone network. I'm now sending some data from the Quectel module. And that's been received at the server, which will send the same data back to the IoT device. There is the notification at the device of the data sent by the server. Output is a status update. I've closed the connection, and that's seen by the server. Now I'm going to show you the same thing over a UDP connection. I'm now starting my UDP echo server. And from the device, I open the UDP connection. So I can see the signaling connection has become idle by the CSCON colon zero status message. So the device will take a little while to re-establish an active connection. The server then receives the data from the IoT device and echoes the same data back. The data is received at the IoT device, and again output as a status update. At the end, I close the UDP socket. The signaling connection then returns to idle mode. Next, I'm going to show you how to use the power saving mode, which is useful for low power and especially battery powered devices. One of the great new features introduced with mobile IoT is power saving mode. When this is activated, the device stays active on the mobile network, but the radio unit is no longer having to transmit or listen for network activity. This allows the cellular modem to substantially reduce its battery consumption. It's reckoned that this can help IoT devices to achieve a 10 plus year battery life for many IoT use cases. Even better, this can be controlled by software at the IoT device according to the requirements of specific use cases. I've reset the device configuration again, so it will start as if it's a new device. I have a set of ready prepared AT commands so I can show you what happens to enable power save mode and what happens at the device and server with this. I'll run my TCP echo server again now, and I'm rebooting the Quetel BC66 board, enabling echoing of the AT commands back to the output, verifying the manufacturer model and firmware version, now, just for the moment, I'm disabling power save mode while I configure the narrowband IoT connection and also disabling the device sleep mode. I'm now enabling logging of network registration events to the output, also the logging of signaling connection events, and this will be particularly important, the logging of narrowband IoT events, including entering and exiting power save mode. I'm now configuring the Quetel BC66 to search band 20 only for Vodafone UK and setting the required access point name for the Vodafone NBIOC network. Now I'm checking if there's a data session attached. Nope, not yet. I'll wait for the device to register. If I check again on the data session, I'll see the device is now attached and a DNS lookup should now give me the IP address of the GSMA web server. I can check the power save mode setting. A value of zero indicates this is currently disabled. So I'm now going to show what happens if I leave a TCP session open so that you can see what happens with power save mode disabled. I'm opening the connection to the server. After a while, the signaling connection goes idle. After 30 seconds, I'll then send some data. The server receives that data and replies. Of course, what you won't have seen at this point are any power save mode status changes. We'll see those when I rerun this test in a while. I'll now close this connection. You will see the signaling connection going from idle to active as the socket is closed. 
the server then sees the socket being closed. I'm now going to enable power save mode. The AT command CPSMS allows the application to request power saving mode along with required configuration. Inside the quoted strings are two different binary represented values. The first of these is the tracking area update setting. This governs the interval that the IoT device signals its presence to the network. The second of these is the activity timer, and this indicates how long the device will stay in its normal idle mode after which it can enter power save mode. It's hard to explain in this video, but we have a document with further information about this. The tracking area update setting is in two parts. Bits 6, 7 and 8 define the timer units, which measure from as little as two second increments up to increments of 320 hours. Bits 5 to 1 indicate the multiple of those units that are required. In this request, I'm asking for two second units times 10, therefore, 20 second tracking area updates to be agreed with the network. The active time setting is also in two parts. Again, bits 6, 7 and 8 define the timer units, and this time that ranges from two second units up to 10 hour units. Bits 5 to 1 are the multiple of those units. The units coding is slightly different to the tracking area update, but again, I've selected two second units. This time is times five, so power saving mode should start after 10 seconds of connection being idle. I'm now going to request power saving mode, and the network should confirm the selection. The network has confirmed that power save mode will commence after 10 seconds of idle, but has indicated different tracking area update interval, using 10 minute intervals times seven, so a total interval of 70 minutes. This is not a problem, as it will actually be better for battery saving. Now the connection has gone idle. And after 10 seconds, you see that the device has entered power saving mode. This is all happening automatically between the IoT device and the network. I'm now going to create a TCP connection to my server. See, the device exits power save mode and makes the network connection. The signaling connection has gone idle again. And now the modem has entered power save mode. If you look at the server, as far as it's concerned, the TCP connection remains alive. If I send data, you'll see the device exits power save mode, re-establishes a signaling connection, and sends the data to the server. And you'll see the data return to the IoT device. The device will go into idle mode, and we should see it entering power save mode again after another 10 seconds. I'm then closing the connection. The device exits power save mode to do this. After a further delay, the device goes idle again and will enter power save mode after a further 10 seconds. I hope this has been useful to show you just how easy it is to have the device reduce its power consumption without any real work by the application. Once power saving mode is requested, everything happens automatically between the device and the network. I'm now going to show you some of the features for use of the LWM2M stack in the Quetel BC66 module. The lightweight machine-to-machine -machine standard was developed to support efficient data communications and control for constrained devices with limited bandwidth. As with the earlier demonstration, I have a set of ready-prepared AT commands so I can show you the use of the LWM2M commands and what happens at the device and server with this. For this section, I'm going to use the open source Lishan LWM2M server to interact with the Quetel BC66 module. This comes from the Eclipse Foundation. Now I've reset the device configuration again, but I'm going to fast forward through the parts where I get a connection. The first step in using LWM2M is to set the configuration using the qlwconfig command. This specifies the server IP address, port number, identity of the device, which I'm setting to GSMA test, and the lifetime of the connection and the security mode. Again note that this server has been whitelisted by Vodafone as a security mechanism so that my IoT device is protected against attack from external sources. Now I'll register the device with the Lishan LWM2M server. I'm going to test the registration has been made by attempting to update the registration period. The error at the device showed that the registration hadn't completed, but in the meantime the server registered the session. You can see the device registered at the server, 
and you can also view the various attributes. LWM2M maintains a set of various device attributes, which is shown in several groups. This includes a set of device attributes and methods, for example, to reboot the device remotely. I'm going to scroll down to the end as currently the device is just registered as a generic device, and I want to configure it with some specific property types. LWM2M has a set of predefined attribute types which have numeric identifiers, so I'm going to add a couple of those. I'll define a light control instance for the device. And you can see then that the various attributes related to the light control are displayed on the server. Similarly, I'll define a temperature sensor instance for the device. and you'll see that the various temperature sensor attributes are also shown. So now it's possible to read and write attributes using LWM2M. For example, if I want to remotely request the light switched on, I can set the on-off attribute to true. And this will be notified to the IoT device. To confirm this has been accepted, I can send a write response, which needs to include the message ID from the notification. The server then confirms the new value for the attribute. Similarly, I can issue a read request from the server. And this results in a notification to the device for the required attribute. So I can send a response to the read request, including the attribute value and the request message ID. And the server shows the updated value for the on-off attribute. Finally, I want to show you some of the support in place for checking the device information from the server side. Here I'm requesting the manufacturer, model, serial number, and then firmware version of the device. And then I'll request the current time from the device. So thank you for watching. That's it for this visual guide. A big thank you to Quetel for providing the BC66 modules I've used in this guide, and Vodafone for the IoT SIM card. Remember, if you didn't watch our first guide on setting up the BC66 with the Vodafone network, that would be useful to see now. Also, watch out for our next visual guide on IoT security.